Good morning, folks. Dr. Charlie Hall here, Texas A&M University, holder of the Ellison Chair in International Floriculture, and I'm delighted to welcome you to uh, another great webinar today in our webinar series on behalf of, of Marco Palma, who's my colleague here in the Department of Agriculture Economics. We, we bid you welcome. So I would be remiss if I didn't mention our sponsors. Uh, this webinar series is sponsored by the Southern Risk Management Education Center and then also the Texas Nursery and Landscape Association. So quick shout out and thank you to those particular entities. Well, today we're going to focus in on a little different topic than our last webinar. We were talking about cool plants uh, last time, and now we're going to talk about some potentially cool labels to put on those plants. And we're going to talk about implications of, of plant labeling that's local and organic related and what impact that has, if any, on plant sales. So, but before we get started on that, I've got a little bit of uh, housekeeping. Uh, as you know, if you've attended the webinar series before, there's a, a control panel that has popped up whenever you uh, started your webinar session. And if you want to change any of the settings today, you can click on that orange arrow at the upper left-hand side, and you can open and close that panel if it happens to get in your way. And then also you can adjust some of the settings if you want to make that uh, the presentation is a full screen, you can click on view and click full screen and it'll open up uh, the, in the entirety of your window. And then if by chance, if you get the little feedback from the microphone and speakers, you can also click on use telephone uh, by, by just clicking on the audio set up, set up there or clicking the audio, uh, the radio button for use telephone dialing the number that you see, not this one that's on the screen now, but the number that you see that pops up on your screen, and then plugging in the audio pin accordingly. Now, we're not going to have the mics live today, so each one of you has been muted. So if you have any questions, the way we're going to handle it is that you type in your question in the box that says questions. And uh, I'll be monitoring that throughout, and if there's a question of that's of clarifying nature, then I may interrupt then and, and, and ask that question then, or we may save all the questions toward the end. It just all, all depends. Now, speaking of the end, when we finish up in approximately 39 minutes and 46 seconds from now, uh, there's a short evaluation survey, and as you've heard my pitch to you before, it really does make a difference when you take uh, you know, a couple of minutes, and it's a very short survey, five questions, and in some cases it may not even take you two minutes to fill this thing out, but it helps us in evaluating not just the content that we just provided, but helping us decide what the future content of this webinars will be. And then lastly, the session is being recorded today, so in about 24 hours from now, you should be receiving an email with excuse me, with a link to the recorded version of today's session. So you can look forward to that. So if you happen to get interrupted and you got a, a fire to put out and you just absolutely have got to leave, no sweat because this is being recorded and you can, you can view it uh, at a later date, as well as invite some of your colleagues in your respective businesses to, to perhaps watch this webinar as well. So without further ado, let's get to the introductions uh, for our speaker today. It's my privilege to introduce a friend of mine who just happened to get his PhD from here at Texas A&M, so we know that he has a, a vast knowledge base in which to work off of. And he, he uh, did, by doing so, of course, he, he greatly compensated for his other two degrees from Auburn <laughs> University. <laughs> And uh, that's a joke between Ben and I, but uh, Ben Campbell is an assistant professor and extension economist at the University of Connecticut. He spent some time at the Violin Research Center across the border and, uh, and, and developed a name for himself uh, pretty readily in the green industry. And now we're, we're glad and pleased to have him on this side of the border working on behalf of, of nursery and greenhouse growers and, 
and landscape service providers and retailers in the green industry in the U.S. So we're delighted that Ben is our speaker today. And, and so without further ado, Ben, I'm going to go up here and change the presenter to you. And you'll see the message pop up that will say, um, make your screen live, and then I'll turn the floor over to you. So can you see the screen? Um, yeah, so thanks, Charlie, uh, and thanks, everyone, from be for being here. Um, first of all, the thing is that I grew up in the southeast, so sometimes I talk slow and spent a lot of time the last several years in the northeast, so my talk a little faster now. So if I get talking fast or slow, just uh, let Charlie or I know, and I'll try to adjust sort of how fast I'm talking. Um, so sometimes it, sometimes it comes into play, sometimes not. Um, so, yeah, as Charlie said, I've been at uh, University of Connecticut for a little over a year, um, but I've been uh, trying to understand green industry consumers for a little over a decade. Um, the topic today on local and organic, I get really so excited about talking about it um, as they're su such simple words, but they're very complex. So today let's take some time to discuss uh, implications of local or organic plant labeling on plant sales in the green industry. So that being said, uh, caveat, local and organic are hot button issues. Um, you, can look, you can just type the words in and look at media coverage, and there are very vocal groups that care about local and organic. Um, so they're hot button, bring, up, bring, up, bring about strong emotions. So what we're going to discuss over the next few minutes are my observations from experiences of working in several states in, um, in Ontario, um, as well as from the academic and trade press literature and talking and being in the industry. So these views are mine. They don't they do not reflect Connecticut in any way whatsoever. So just give that caveat because I know that these terms can bring about strong emotions. So over the next little bit, uh, several several objectives. Sort of discuss the state of state and federal labeling regarding uh, overall uh, local and organic labeling and also how it applies to plants. And plant labeling. Uh, the benefits of local and organic, organic labeling um, for plants, impact on consumers' purchase decision, and implications for the green industry. So that's what we're going to cover in the next little bit. So as we all know, the green industry is very competitive. It's a competitive uh, world out there, um, finite number of consumers, um, and plants are generally not viewed as a necessity, but more as a luxury. So people can give them up when times are bad and pick up and buy when times are good. Um, and we're competing against both necessities and luxury, other luxury items when we're trying to make a sale. Um, and we're competing against all these other products in a variety of ways. Advertising, for instance. I couldn't find any statistics for adults, but kids on average see about 40,000 TV commercials per year for all the products. That's about 100 commercials per day that kids are seeing advertisements. So as we try to think of adults, they're probably seeing more. So as we try to get people to buy, we need to tap into things that interest them. Uh, there's another study by the Kaiser Foundation, uh, Family Foundation, that found that in a day, kids are packing 8.5 hours of media attention into 6. hours per day, seven days a week. So they're multitasking. And same with adults. You're using smartphones, all these types of things to better understand what you're buying. Um, think of uh, QR codes. So people want to be involved. There's a lot of choices out there. People want to get involved with what they're buying. So how do we compete? A number of – there's two big issues that I think the green industry is very um, set up well to capitalize on. Capitalize may be a bad word, but to uh, look at on basically environmental and sustainable issues and supporting the community, especially around when we talk about local. So the two big issues that I think that we're going to address today and how labeling can sort of get consumers to think about the, how – the plants are buying relating to these two issues. So, and that goes back to looking at um, getting someone, how do you get someone to buy tomatoes or herbs or um, peppers and flowers? So how do we get people to choose these compared to all the other things that they have on the market to buy? So the origins of labeling generally start out in fruits and vegetables. So I'd be remiss to not talk about a little bit about fruits and vegetables. Um, these are two labels that are big in the Northeast, uh, Connecticut Grown that we're using here, um, and Jersey Fresh. Um, these are not governmental programs, but state programs where pretty much every state has a logo, and tremendous resources are being pushed to promote these, and a lot of these apply to fruits and vegetables. But there's a spillover effect 
into the plant ornamental sector as well because these labels as they push to say buy local buy local that translates into buying local buying plants as well whereas organic is a little bit different in that there's a federal logo um, that's out there and it's probably not as much big a push at the state level to buy um, or to, to uh, get out the organic message um, it's generally coming from certain producers and in the sector certain uh, associations uh, the perceptions for these local these uh, labels is varying generally for local people generally associate it with as some type of uh, local geography generally it's the state is the local geography that's uh, put around local um, but there are misperceptions that go along with that label for organic generally the perception in the food industry is generally it's about pesticide usage and synthetic uh, pesticide usage or lack thereof um, which causes an issue as we'll talk about in a little bit about how that plays into how consumers view organic labeling when you look at plants so let's talk a little bit background on sort of federal state and labels uh, for local there are none in the US as far as federal labels for local Canada is a different story. Spending the last couple of years there, up until moving to Connecticut, um, Canada, does have, Canada does have federal reg regulations around what can be defined as local. And the new, and they just have updated their uh, regulations as they try to find a permanent rule. They have an interim rule that says that local is grown within a province or within 50 kilometers from the point of sale. So you could grow in Ontario, you could grow in Quebec, as long as it's 50 kilometers. From your point of sale into Ontario. So there are these federal regulations um, in Canada, but not into the US. And those are applying across the board for plants, foods. They're generally set up for foods, but they do apply to plants as well. Certified organic in the US and Canada have strict regulations um, that go along with these two being certified, and they're very similar. So are, there are these like regulations. Local, generally, there's no organic regulations. It all comes about to the local messaging. And what's interesting, though, is when you look at the, the states, that pretty much every state has a logo, but a lot of states, generally, the logo is a one size fits all for if I have a plant or a fruit, vegetable, the same label goes on it. Even though a lot of these labels are geared towards fruit and vegetable or food, can, food use, not for plants. There are a couple of states that are different. You've got Texas, uh, the Go Texan label generally applies to pretty much any kind of product, but the Texas super, Superstar goes more along, along the lines of is for plants, and they have to be tested by Texas A&M to fit certain criteria before it can be awarded this Texas Superstar label. Perhaps a really good example of just using the fruit and vegetable or the food label to slightly change it to fit the plant needs is Jersey, New Jersey. New Jersey has the Jersey Fresh for their fruit and vegetables and foods. Then they have the Jersey Grown, which is a slight variation to fit in for the um, their plant sector. Uh, and it's used for uh, plants, trees, shrubs, and flowers. And what's interesting is their certifying item is grown in New Jersey. It's accustomed to the state soil and growing conditions. It's checked for quality and is disease and pest free. So these labels are being specifically designed for the plant is the plant ornamentals to give a certain message that may not necessarily sort of that fruit and vegetables or other types of foods may not need. So these are two instances where there is a definite um, label going on to try to promote local with regards to plants. Uh, the benefits of local and organic. Um, what's interesting is that what we're sort of seeing a shift is, that's coming for local and organic, especially in fruits and vegetables, but also it's affecting what's happening with plants. And why do these matter? What type of person's buying? Well, we should see this shifting focus. In the beginning, organic was generally related to environmentally or sustainable was its message. So when you saw an organic label, you saw that implied environmentally or sustainable practices. Now the shift has generally been to uh, uh, pesticide usage and the, or the lack thereof of for synthetic pesticides. It's sort of the shift. And that goes to the fact that the egoistic consumers, consumers that generally think about themselves, and care about themselves, it's not at the expense of others, but they really care about what, what's happening to them, are leaning more towards organic. And it's, it's because of this shift due to pesticide usage. Whereas altruistic and biospheric, so those consumers that care about their their or their people in their community, and those people who care about the environment, are now more leaning towards local. 
So we have this shift away from local. What it traditionally was was helping the local community. It's also now doing that, but also helping looking at the environment. So there's still this shift that's going on with organic and local um, and in the marketplace. And as as firms, we need to be aware of that to understand how consumers are valuing these and how messages can be applied to them. Uh, there was an interesting study by Stephanie Burnett and Lois Stack, um, University of Maine, that found that there was substantial growth in organic greenhouse production. But 75% of those surveyed said that they're doing it because the producer thinks it's the right thing to do, not because of market demand. And this article is being published in Hort Technology. But it's interesting that for organic especially, people are doing it, seem to be producing, not because there's a market out there, but because they think this is the right, right thing to do for the environment. So there's that little bit of um, thing going on as far as they're not doing it to satisfy consumers as much, but more to um, just do it in a way that they feel benefits them. Perhaps one of the most interesting things I've read in this area um, it came out of a uh, grant that the Connecticut Nursery Landscape Association, Association got a couple years ago um, from the uh, Specialty Crop uh, Block Grant. Um, and the synopsis appears in nursery management. There's the URL um, where you can just Google it and you can find this um, the synopsis that's given in the nursery management. Um, but it addresses the benefits of local. Why do people, how do people value local and what do they think of when they see a local label on a um, plant? So this is specifically for plants. And we find generally four areas that people really resonate with the local labeling. Uh, the first is that community a, community aspect. Local is helping the local community and the kinetic economy. It's giving back back to the state. It's keeping money in the state. And people feel that they're being loyal to the state when they're using this local label, or when, they're, when they see local plants, which goes back to sort of that original meaning of what local meant. It was helping the local economy, helping um, the com people in the community. The second thing that uh, that's come about they found was of this focus group was that there is a plants generally when they're labeled local and consumers know they're local there's sort of they'll survive better here there's this sort of acclimation that they don't have to worry about putting it out planting it and then the plant just will not survive so if it's grown here it's acclimated and they're ready to be planted and they're more resistant to disease because they've grown up with it it's very much like uh, people when you go to a new environment you're not exposed to all the germs and things in the area so you have to go through an acclimation phase. Same thing for what people are seeing with local plants that, and local labeled plants that plants are more disease resistant, they're more acclimated, and they're ready to go what's happening in the environment. Third thing that they found was that generally people associate quality. It's a quality. Plants are fresher, higher quality plant, less travel, therefore less wear and tear at the garden center. Um, I think these are very interesting because these sort of relate to what happens, what you see in fruits and vegetables and other foods as well. There's that quality. So consumers see it as a quality, what's grown here, it's getting to me in a shorter amount of time, it's been taken care of, and it is quality. So these are some, an image that people, it's not, it's not an image you can, you can look at the plant, but people have it sort of this perceived that it has this other attributes associated with it, and it's a, it's a better plant compared to if it's imported from other places. Uh, the sort of the final thing goes around with pricing. Uh, there seems to be two sets of consumers, and we'll talk about that uh, in a few minutes, um, that some consumers feel it should be lower priced. If you bring it in from a uh, shorter distance, there's less freight cost, therefore it's lower priced. Another group says that if there's, I mean, I'm getting all these other benefits, I'm getting that, I'm helping the community, I also getting a plant that's acclimated and to disease and weather and I'm getting a better quality plant so I'm willing to pay a little price premium because of that where it's grown where it's coming from uh, but there's strong encouragement we go back to the labeling a few minutes ago there's a strong encouragement especially in Connecticut to have some kind of a label that shows that it's a plant grown in Connecticut so sort of differentiate this from a um, the food label Connected grown to have more of a label that sort of it's a plant grown label instead, which is interesting because only some states are starting to do that. But there seems to be a consumer awareness that hey, we might want to think about this and do this um, in the future to denote here's what the label would mean to, for plants. 
Organics, uh, there's a little bit less information as far as um, going on about organics, especially uh, sort of like the study we just talked about. Um, but generally, organic benefits revolve around better for the environment, sustainable. Um, and one of the things that's happening is that you see that other labels are starting to emerge that are also sort of capturing, cannibalizing this message of environmentally and um, sustainable, and such as local, eco-friendly, sustainable, those types. Those labels are sort of being shown to actually be very well associated with organic, being characterized as organic, and so people are perceiving them to be environmentally friendly. So there's some things happening that could potentially take market share away from organic labeled plants, given that these terms are starting to become synonymous. We haven't studied as much. Um, I think it's an area we need to look into more, but it's very interesting that all these labels, that generally you don't have to go through the cost of certification, that now can be sort of taking the form of organic, taking the name of organic in for their own. So um, I think that's very interesting, especially for marketing. Not saying there's not a market for organic out there. It's just saying that there's a for those consumers who do not value organic to a large degree, these other labels may be siphoning off market share from organic label plants compared to other um, label plants like sustainably labeled and local and eco-friendly. Um, impact on consumers' decision. Uh, very interesting. When you look across the things that have been done, generally we see – Consumers are not the same. They're not homogeneous. They're not everyone does not go into a store and say, you know, "I only care about price. I only care about X, Y, or Z." What we see is the, the market's fragmented. It's heterogeneous. So generally, for most studies, we see that price-sensitive consumers, consumers who walk in the store and just care about price, generally make up between 10 and 20 percent of the market. So these are the people that go in and say, "Hey, I want the lowest price thing you've got." roughly 10 to 20 percent of the market. Those who are environmentally conscious, who would probably be the consumers that would be very much looking for organic, generally make up 10 to 20 percent 20 percent of the market. So it's not a huge huge group either. And we think of foods, we think of for foods, 5 percent of consumers buy 50 percent of organic product. So it, that sort of fits in the line here that those consumers are environmentally conscious make up rather small percentage of the market per se. When you think it between 60 and 80 percent of the market, value a combination of other attributes, um, which could be local, could be other types of um, labeling or quality as well. So all those things go into 60 to 80 percent. So on a whole, most consumers are not purely price sensitive and not purely environmentally conscious, but are some combination thereof and value um, attributes at different levels. So when we look at buying decision, let's, let's think of a pie. So you have a pie sitting on a table. When people look at a plant that's local and so grown locally, generally 21% of, of the pie is devoted towards local. So 21% of the buying decision is impacted by local. Production practice is around 16%, and then price is roughly 16%. Uh, for those consumers that would be uh, price sensitive, this will, of course, be higher. The more price sensitive you are, the more likely you are to really value what that price is, and that's going to drive your decision to purchase. But we do see that local is important in, in the decision for a lot of consumers. It's not the only thing. It's not the thing that's going to drive – if I say local, people are going to buy it. But it's one of those things that can be a mechanism to get someone to – if they're on the fence, you might flip them over to actually buy or uh, plant if you sort of indicate where it's from. Uh, same thing for production practice. It could be a driver to flip someone over if it is important to them and if, it, um, if they're, everything else is the same. There are those consumers that just care about local and just care about production practices such as organic, but on average, it's roughly in the mix, um, the same percentage as other attributes that we see for plants. Looking at interest in different types of plants, um, I think this, this table is fascinating uh, for several respects. Um, you have what you have are means um, and interest in different type plant types. So one would be – so if someone put a one, they, that would mean low interest, seven is high interest. So the average is around 3.5. Um, what we see is that conventional actually does better than organic. And I'm going to show you a study in a second that actually – that they, they sort of prove this in a way, that consumers are valuing conventional probably more than um, organic um, in production. 
not to say organic's bad, not to say organic is not valued, but what we generally see are seeing is that organic, unlike foods, organic tends to be fragmenting down for plants. It fragments them down to particular production practices. So the word organic as a whole in foods is, is beginning to mean pesticide-free. Well, for plants, we're seeing it's generally taking these more environmental terms. We see the efficient greenhouse does really well in the rating of how um, of interest. Uh, bio pot, different types of pots, organic fertilizer. These type of terms are very specific in what they are, and I think that's what's happening for organic is you, that for plants, especially, we see it instead of organic being a keyword. We're seeing specific production practices emerging as things that consumers are really valuing in what they buy. Well, local, it's one of the highest. For people value local at around 4.1 on a seven-point scale, which is one of the highest groups, one of the highest ratings in the – one of the highest means in the uh, group, uh, attributes we tested. So it looks like local is, seems to be really important, whereas organic – is moving and fragmenting into different, small, uh, more specific production practices that are important. This is a picture of sort of the same graph that I showed a few minutes ago, uh, or just showed in the last thing. It just has it every, these are differences from the conventional. So the conventional rating, so we took the rating for local and subtracted it uh, way, the conventional rating, so these are just those differences in consumer interest. But I think it gives a very interesting point. Organic was generally related was, – was rated lower than conventional, which we just talked about. But it doesn't mean that organic is bad or unwanted. It's just I think we should do it – if you're going to market something as an organic plant, you're going to look at it's probably a niche market for the organic label. And again, that 5% of consumers buy 50% of organic food. So it's going to be for a select group that's really caring about all the things that go into organic, which I don't think comes as a surprise. It's just that what we see is that we have other things that are taking more of an impact consumers are caring about for organic, the efficient greenhouse, biopots, different messages as far as water saving, energy saving, those types of things are becoming very important in, for plant sales as compared to food sales. And again, we have the local uh, pretty much up there around the top as far as what keep driving interest, especially compared to conventional, conventional plants. Um, that's on the market. And again, I'm putting at the bottom, you see UA at all. Um, that's where this, that's where the source of information. So if anyone has or questions about where they can get a copy of the article or a copy of what are, uh, the science, what's being presented, just let me know and we can uh, probably get that to you. So we had this talk about verification. So a couple years ago, uh, roughly nine, ten years ago now, um, there was a study done um, out of Florida. And what they did was they got permission to sell two types of lantana, one organically grown and one conventionally grown, side by side in a garden center. And this was a garden center that promotes environmental practices. So there, this is one of those – it's not just your ordinary store that just says go buy. They're actively promoting their environmental practices. So they put lantana that was conventionally grown. Then they had an organic version that had certain types of organic practices done. And they gave it a 50 cent price premium and another organic that had a little bit of a different set of organic practices and had a dollar price premium per plant. And what they found was conventionally grown plants outsold organic, organically grown lantana. So the conventional did better than the lantana. I don't think this is a necessarily indication that people are opposed to organic. I think this is more of a 50 cents and a dollar or probably it's probably a very high premium for plants per plant. So I, my bet, my guess is just in other things we've seen that what you would see if you had a lower premium for organics, then you would then experience it, and you could probably sell as or equivalent to conventional if we looked at the premium to find out exactly what the premium should be compared to doing 50 cents on a dollar. Um, but we do see that, I mean, conventionally, you can't just go out there and put organic prices and bump them up as far as there is a limit to what consumers will pay. Or they will revert back and do – they will do conventionally grown. And I think this very much says the same thing, for, same thing for local. We generally preach that local gets you get a price premium, but there is a limit that consumers will pay for the, either locally or um, organically grown product. So we talked about willingness to pay, just hinted at it a little bit. And what we see is that willingness to pay for local – there's several studies that have gone, uh, gone on 
to look at this. Um, and I think one of the best ones out there now coming at looking at willingness to pay is the Texas Superstore um, and the brand premium. And this is a study that came out of Texas A&M I think a couple years ago. And what they had was there was basically a 10% price premium that the Texas Superstore brand would could, could garner in the marketplace overall. Would everyone pay that? No. Would some pay more? Yes. But on average, roughly a 10% price premium. If they are aware of the brand, then they would pay 11% premium on top of the average price premium on the market. So if you're aware of the brand and intimate with it, understand what's going on, then you would pay even more than just this price premium that you found by labeling as Texas Superstar. And again, Texas Superstar is those plants that have been tested and are sort of have the check mark of approval saying that they are acclimated, they fit the Texas environment, and they get um, sort of the seal of approval. So but consumers are well willing to pay, pay for it. And this goes back to what's, what's happening in um, states and the different states. You've got some states that are putting their label out there that says, I'm locally grown, and it goes for any kind of product. But it doesn't speak to will the plant grow, where you have something like Texas Superstar and the New Jersey grown label that's now saying, look, this is acclimated to our climate. It has less disease because um, it's been grown here and it fits our soil type and those, those types of things. So those labels where you're growing this, this sort of quality image will garner and can garner a little bit higher premium. Um, so that's something that's of interest and depending on where you're at, is going to make a great deal on what type of label and what type of image you're putting out there for your locally grown plant. Um, it can't be that you just say it's locally grown and and there's got to be a little bit more to it than that. There has to be this image that, I mean, it's acclimated, it's ready for diseases in our environment, and those type of things. Those type of branding, those type of labels, and those type of messages will then allow you to either get a price premium or, probably just as important, sell more. Because if just because something doesn't get a price premium doesn't mean it's not valuable. If you can sell more product by labeling it a certain way, then it could be just as valuable as getting – five, ten cents more. It, so just because it doesn't get, don't get a price premium doesn't mean it's not important. Um, we looked at carbon saving a couple years ago, and that's generally trending to be a local attribute give, based on that local reduces carbon footprint because you don't have to drive it as far. Um, and what we found was that there was basically a 17 cent per plant premium that we could attribute to. If we could say it was carbon saving, then we could get to seven cent, 17 cent premium per plant. Um, again, that's not a, a, a huge premium, um, but it is a premium that we could sort of expect if we could label something carbon saving. And it's probably that local nature of the product will will carry this carbon saving sort of perception with it in the uh, marketplace. When we look at willingness to pay for organic, uh, willingness to pay for organic is sort of hit or miss. Uh, there, there's some literature out there. Most of it is focused on foods. Um, but there is a little bit, some stuff going on. Again, that carbon saving, uh, we talked about a second ago, 17 cents per plant. Organic can transition, say, this carbon saving. Probably not as good as local can now in uh, today's climate, but there is that. Um, Charlie, uh, mentioned, well, I mentioned earlier that generally we're seeing that these production practices are shifting towards a set of organic label. We're moving to more of a product a production specific label such as water saving or other type of uh, energy saving um, those type of messages so the earth kind brand coming out of uh, Texas as well which took sustainable landscapes and those type of things um, could see a 10 percent premium if aware and a 10 percent um, label uh, premium for just having the having the um, the label on the product so again what we're seeing is these we don't see organic per se as being as big an industry as and really capturing market share like it does in foods, but we see that some consumers will pay, especially for when you talk about directly the production specific production practice that is being applied to the plant. And I think that's very important for the industry because for the most part, we're doing things that are environmentally, or environmentally friendly or sustainable. We're doing these things. Generally, we don't talk about them. We're, we're just, we do them and we let them sit there. But we could be showcasing what we're doing 
and then not it may, may not be getting a price premium, but we could be bringing good press, increasing sales just by getting people because it increases their likelihood of buying because we're showing that we're being sustainable and um, those type of things. Uh, then we see biopods, which are uh, another issue. We saw price premiums ranging from 23 cents to 58 cents per pot or per plant. Uh, the 58 cent premium, the uh, problem with that pot is generally it's a problem in the production system. So, um, but we can so we do see premiums on biopots, and biopots are again taking that sort of not organic, but they're taking that production method specifically and saying, "Here's what I'm doing," and consumers are valuing it. Uh, we did this uh, last year, a couple of years. I think this was last year's when we did this study, um, looking at eye tracking technology to see do people actually look at labels that are have environmental messaging on them. Um, what you see is that we have a price on the right-hand side, $1.99 per container. We have a production practice on the left-hand side, grown using sustainable practices. And then we have a whole display of things that are different types of fruits, and uh, I think tomatoes and I think there are peppers in there. And what we see is when we look at directly at the labels, we do see that labels are being looked at. In this case, red implies that consumers are spending a lot of time fixating, fixating on it. So for the production label, you can say, okay, there's a lot of time being spent on this production label. And the one issue with, they might come up would be, of course, there's more words on it. It takes longer time to read. But what we see is that those people who are price, who are um, environmentally conscious spend a lot, of time, a lot more time compared to the other groups reading the sign. They find it faster and they look at it longer. If you're price conscious, then you're looking at the price sign faster and longer. So we do see not only do these labels – that people are looking at them, that's driving their decision to buy, and it is can increase likeliness to buy, and it also in some cases can produce a price premium um, for certain consumers. Not all consumers, but for certain consumers, we see that. So this is a heat map of what's happening um, and how someone progressed through the sign. So in this case, looking at it again, you see they started out looking at the plants, then moved to what the pine is, looked at the production labeling, and really in this case, they glanced at the price sign just for a little bit, read it. They spent a lot of time on the plants and the production practice. So, again, there is value in these signs, of gaining attention, getting consumers aware, and appealing to the things we talked about at the beginning, the two big issues that are confronting people now and people are talking about, sustainability, environmental, and community, uh, helping your local community. So we see this here that consumers actually do look at these labels and are making decisions based on that. Um, looking at sort of the demographic profiles of what's going on with the demographic drivers um, for organic and local. Uh, organic wise, we're seeing that age, generally as age increases, the likelihood of buying from these, something that's organic, decreases. So the older consumers are moving away from organic, especially if this is for plants. So they're moving away from from plant buying organic as older you get. But the more organic food you buy, the more likely you are to value organic. So it's what you expect. If you're buying organic food, well, okay, well, I get the message there. I translate it over to organic as well. But as we think about most food is bought by very few – most organic food is bought by a very few number of consumers. Um, and so I think this – even though this is significant – it has a limited potential, especially trying to target people what they buy food-wise. But we see for herbs and vegetable buyers, foods that you consume, we see the organic message really has a bigger impact. So if you're buying herbs and vegetables, you're more likely to buy organic or something labeled organic, which is as expected, right? As far as you're buying it, putting your body, you might get back to that pesticide image of no pesticide use or no synthetic pesticide use, and so you're valuing organic. When we look at local – what we see is that females generally have a positive – we talk about their consumers. We talk about females or women. We talk about that there's a positive image for local as far as – gen, women generally want to buy local. Um, there's a positive association there as far as purchasing local by women. Um, some studies have found negative brand awareness for state programs for women and older consumers. So this sort of creates a dichotomy. We see that women, for a large part, may not be as aware of – be of brands, of state brands or other types of brands talking about local, 
But yet, if they are willing to pay, buy local at a higher clip than men. So it may be some educational to under, get women to understand these brands are out there and get the um, female consumers, women cons the women cons the female consumers to know what the brand is because that could translate into uh, more sales. Um, and then we have organic food again comes up as a positive driver. Herbs and vegetables again come up as positive. Um, that goes back to helping consumers, that fresh and quality appeal that we talked about earlier, that if it's fresher, if it's better quality, one, you could get more tomatoes, you could get more um, your herbs, are, you get more production, more yield. Um, but we also see it with perennial buyers as well, valuing this local um, labeling. So sort of winding down um, on what we talked about, covered a lot of things, I think. Um, there is a market for local and organic product. Despite everything I've said, um, there is a market for products labeled with these labels. These labels do have value. They're not the same. Everyone doesn't care. You're not going to see if you put an organic label up or a local label up that everyone comes in and buys everything you have. Consumers are fickle, but they're set in what they, what they value. Consumers are different. Organic consumers, what we generally see is there seems to be a focus on environmental attributes, not organic as a whole, but more specific attributes looking at production practices specifically and other types of sustainability messaging that can be done. And we see that there are small segment consumers who are heavily on organic labeling. But in general, this could be a this sustainability message could be a driver if all else is equal, then it could be a driver to get someone to buy, so thereby increasing sales. But I don't know if organic per se is, from what I've, what I've, all the things that I've seen and you know, talk, the people I've talked with, I don't know if organic per se is a huge driver for, by and large, for most consumers, especially for plants, it is, because they're looking for these very specific attributes that dict, uh, dictate production. Um, so local. Local seems to have a wider consumer base. Um, it has this sort of throwback to what local generally started out as, perceived as helping the community in better quality. It has especially that better helping the community aspect. There's that that local brings with it. And it also has these marketing efforts that organic doesn't have as much. They're coming from states. They're advertising products. So you have buy local campaigns. They're for food a lot of times. But yet, when you start making people aware of buy local, buy local, that trickles over into into uh, the potential for better, more plant sales. Given when someone comes in, oh, it's connected, grown. I'm helping the economy, and I'm also environmentally friendly, right? Because there's some environmental tones in there as well, um, acclimation um, as far as the plant. Those types of things are going on. So this marketing by states is not only helping the state sell food. But it also is impacting uh, plants as well because when you start pounding this message over and over again, buy local, buy local, buy local, if you sell something locally, people will be attuned to it, and um, their likelihood of buying should increase and does increase. Um, we send both local and specific production practices tend to go on our price premiums, but I really reiterate premiums are not a necessity if it increases product turnover. If, if I'm selling something and – Ten cents. I mean, I don't want to raise my price. Why should I label it as local organic? Well, but if I can get turnover, if I can get someone to say, "Hey, I'm going to buy this because I know I'm buying. I'm helping the local producer." That's a win. That's increasing sales just by having some kind of labeling out there. You don't necessarily have to get a price premium. Sometimes it's good with organic. You may need it. Uh, the study I showed earlier from Florida showed that I think like a ten or fifteen cent difference in the price of growing those lantana based on production method, uh, organic versus conventional. So you may have to get a price premium for organic, but if you don't have to, you may not need it. If it increases turnover, which it should, which, given all the things we've seen, there's there's a sort of tendency for organic and local to do that, but if you get increased turnover, then the labeling could work just as easy, especially as cheap as a lot of these signs are. Most part of the ag, ag especially I know in the Northeast, are giving away signs to put in your business. And I mean, so the, the cost of labeling is relatively cheap compared to having to print your own signs and those type of things. 
so the overall message again, local and organic production, especially production specific labeling, can work to improve sales. Every consumer will not care about the label or message. So you have to know your market. You have to know who's in your market and what are they valuing. And so that's something I think is critical. And I go around talking and talking to producers, talking to garden centers, and I ask, who's your market? And they say, everyone. Well, everyone's not your market. There are specific people who are coming to your store. Why are they coming there? And these types of labels, local and organic, can be a very good mechanism to get those people not only to buy but to buy more. And again, we talked about a minute ago that you may not get a price premium, and I keep saying this because I keep here where I, where I go different places. I hear that people they say I can't get a price premium because I'm not going to do it. Well, but if you can flip someone from not buying to buying by having a label that's relatively cheap to put out that creates the image that your so for local creates the image that your product is helping the local economy has a quality, better quality, is acclimated to the environment, ready for the diseases in your environment, those types of things. So you're not just showing this local grown in a certain region, certain area, but you have all these other attributes that are sort of being perceived that are coming from this labeling. Um, with that, one last thing. I thought this was a good quote. Um, and it's not my own. Um, it came out of Michigan State website by Dudek and Behe. Uh, I think it was OFAs where this was sort of brought up that successful businesses in today's world are reflecting their growth based on newer consumer attitudes such as sustainability, recycling, and buying local. Is your message simple enough for the consumer to understand how to be successful with your products? So it goes back to this thing about what are consumers wanting? They're valuing the sustainability. They're valuing the local nature. And sustainable means a lot of different things. We showed earlier sustainable has very complex um, things that go into it such as efficient greenhouses, such as biopods, looking at other types of things, water saving, water conserving uh, practices, energy saving practices, those type of things. Local also brings us things with it as well, such as acclimate to the environment and those type of things. So is your message simple enough that the consumer understands how to, to be successful with your products and are you using these types of labels to influence your consumer's decision? Because consumers are looking for them. They're looking for, they're wanting to be involved we see that's why people are using smartphones and stores and garden centers because they want to be involved. They want to know what's going on to impact the sustainable and their sustainable nature of the world and their community. So how can we use these labels? And we should be using these labels to tell consumers, here's what we're doing. Because in the past, we've been sort of somewhat afraid of doing that, but we need to be because everyone else and every other product is doing that. We should too because we should be proud of that we're either – we're helping the environment, and we're um, helping the communities across the country. So I think that's pretty much it um, for what I had to talk about. Um, I don't, Charlie, I don't know how we're doing on time, but um, I guess there's questions. Yes, in fact, we're doing very well on time, and we do have a few questions. In fact, the first one says, um, I'm involved in uh, doing signage in our retail store. It seems to me, based off of your comments about local, that I should also include benefits about why, or uh, let's see, benefits regarding the um, uh, the product being local. Do you agree or disagree? Yeah, I I I agree that yeah. It, I mean, there's there's going to be consumers that come in that are already going to have these notions about what local is. So they're gonna they're already preconceived notion that local is acclimated. It's ready for basically ready for planting and it's helping the community. Those consumers may not need the message, but there are other consumers that may not have those, all of those types of things. Um, they may not perceive it that way. So I don't see why, why putting those messages out there, I don't see that there's any kind of detriment because you're telling consumers, here's what's happening. Our plants are ready for the environment that we're, you're buying them and put them in. So I, I agree that, I mean, that, that seems, that's a, to me, that's a logical way to go is to put those types of messages on there if you have space. Okay. I'm going to jump down and ask another uh, retail question, and I'll go back up to the next to the one before it. Um, you talked about knowing our market. Um, is, is the best way to know whether local or organic works, and particularly local, is the best way uh, by 
actually testing these labels at the retail level. Now, I paraphrase. I, I think, right. yeah. So I, I think there's two different things. Um, I think one is knowing your market outside of local and organic. I think knowing your market, who is your customer base, who is coming in to buy, um, and what what type of person, what are they looking at, um, and then how are you? And it, it may not be local and organic that they're looking for. But knowing who the consumer is, knowing what they value is something critical. When you go – and I use this example a lot. When you go to a grocery store, they know everything about you. They have – and I've done you – know, doing uh, consumer surveys in grocery stores and other uh, retail establishments. I go in, and especially the larger ones, that they have binders and binders that can tell me anything I want to know about who their shopper is. They can tell me when to show up, when to buy. They know what they're going to buy. So as – a garden center as a retailer selling plants, we may not can get to that level, but we need to understand have a fundamental understanding of who our consumer is. Are they men? Are they women? They act, they act differently. Are they what age group? Because age groups are looking for different things. Um, those type of things we need to have. You need to have a grasp of so that now you can start to understand who is coming in, who is your shopper, and then we can start looking at local and organic. I think, um, and the question about testing it, um, testing it is interesting. Uh, the and a lot of times, as economists, we love to go tinker around in stores, tinker with prices. The problem with that, tinker with different types of attributes, is that you could you could make someone mad and they may not come back. Um, but what we see from evidence is that these labels, consumers, for the most part, for lo local especially, and organic especially specific um, production practices. We don't really see it. There's not a negative effect per se. So if I say something's local, you really don't see shoppers come in and say, "Oh, that's local. I'm not buying here." Or I'm not. I mean, it generally, if you like it, you're more inclined. If you're indifferent, you're indifferent. There's really there's very little negative effect. Maybe for some consumers, for the most part, majority, you're not going to see a negative effect by putting these labels. Organic, it does put a there is some evidence now suggesting that organic does cause a little bit of a negative reaction for some consumers just because it's out there, been out there so long, it's, it's, it's continuing to grow. But if you're talking about production practices and you put up that you use water, water um, conservation practices or you do your energy-efficient greenhouse or whatever, so I don't I see very few consumers coming in and saying, well, that's a bad. So by, I don't know if you have to necessarily test it, but I would think if you're doing it already – then not publicize it, but go out there and put let people know you're doing it. Now, I'm not sure if I answered that question. I yeah, think I grabbed yeah, it on there. I, so. I think you did. Now, let me let me jump back up to the question before, which was related to the Florida study on Lantana that you mm -hmm. referred to. Would people pay more if the product was a tomato plant, a plant versus a Lantana? I the question uh, interesting. I they didn't test it, so I can't say for sure. My guess is that what you're going to see is plants that you consume, people are going to revert back to that sort of – what they've been taught, what, what you learn about food. You know I mean, it's sort of that you're consuming it. So if it was a food-producing plant or a plant you could consume, my guess is you would see a higher willingness to pay, higher premium than for a just a – I mean, Lantana. Mm-hmm. The question comes, I think, would be how much. I think fifty cents to a dollar is is high. I those, those prices, I think, that's one reason they found that organic sold out faster. Uh, I mean, organic sold out in a lot less. Basically, they didn't sell organics in that study. They found conventional sold out in three days. The organics they basically did not sell for the most part. So I, I think that was a price premium. So I think you're going to find that using organic, using local, you, there is going to be a price premium. How big it is is something we're still discovering. I think there is one there. I would, I mean, and I think for certain plants you consume, it's going to be bigger. So if they would have used tomato plants at the prices they put, I don't think they would have sold either way. But if you would have shrunk those down to maybe you're talking a quarter um, or 15 cents, 25 cents, 30 cents, now you're bet, betting you're in the range now of something that consumers would now consider compared to the premiums they used in the Florida study. Gotcha. All right, I got two more questions, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. And and the first is, what qualifies a plant as local? If a nursery orders plugs and plants them in containers for one season before sale, is it local? 
and we, of course, you and I have talked about this before, about the, the definition of organic is fairly standardized now that we have national organic standards. But yeah. What qualifies a plant as local? That, that's a different thing. Go ahead. Yeah, lo local is fascinating in that there's so many definitions, so many things. Um, and what's happening is that a lot of states are now, not say a lot, there are states that are jumping in to classify what exactly is local. So a lot of times it can be state to state. And generally, I what I find is the, generally the most garden centers, most places, even some of the state governments I work with, local is def would defined as who did the majority of the growing. So if I grew the plant for the majority of the time, then I can classify it grown in, grown in my state. Um, mm -hmm. Not all states, I would say, do that. You have to check with your state um, Department of Ags to understand exactly what the exact, if there are specific definitions. But in general, if you're growing it, a majority of the growing is occurring in your garden center is in a certain state, then that would classify as a local. But the definitions are varied, and the definitions vary not by, by state, by consumers, but I would think that most people sort of that majority of production would would detail that. And it's not this isn't that isn't, that topic is not specifically um, for plants. It's happening in food. We get the case right now. We're trying to force connect dairy, trying to understand does dairy what classifies dairy. If I do, if I harvest it, milk a cow in Connecticut, send it to be processed and bring it back, is that local? So this is an issue that's ongoing, and I think as we go. The years to come, we're going to see more and more local regulations come into play to define exactly what local is. Um, because, but I think for now, but for plants, generally a majority of production happening in your garden center or in your greenhouse would classify as a local product. Okay. Now, last question. While you're answering it, I'm going to take back presenter rights. Okay. And, cause I got one quick announcement when you're finished. So this, here's the the last question of the day. Thanks for a very interesting presentation. Do you think large producer states, i.e. Oregon, will or should react to buying the buying local trend and how if they if they should? I, I think large states should. I, and I, and the the I to me there's sort of a, for a lot of these there's a lack of negatives for doing it. And a lot of times you can get the the signage. I mean, so if you put out signage that says, I, I'm local product from Oregon, and no one and no one cares, they don't care because they know everything's from Oregon, you, a little, I mean, sorry, no harm, no foul, no, they're not really going to say, well, you have that sign up, so I'm not going to buy from you. So there's sort of this, one of those things that it's, there's a little, sort of a lack of a negative there, that if you put up the label, you put out the signage, the, the worst thing is you're making people aware that you sell. It may not impact their decision to buy it whatsoever, but it could. Mm -hmm. And that's that's where the issue is, is does it matter? I think what's going to happen in time, and it's starting – starting, especially academics are starting to look at this a little bit more, is the regional local labels, and not regional within the country, but regional within state. So take a state like California that you have nor – being northern California versus southern California is a huge difference. So I think there's going to be a trend to now sort of localize local into smaller and smaller areas. That may be something you want to do that may have a bigger effect than saying you're Oregon grown, saying you're southwest Oregon grown or northern Oregon grown, those type of things. I think that's where we're going to be moving to for a lot of states, especially with high production areas or um, larger states. Exactly. Ben, this has been outstanding. Super job. And I enjoyed it. Yeah, appreciate you being here and, and sharing the the latest and greatest on on local and organic labeling uh, as far as plant sales in the green industry. And uh, I just remind folks that this webinar has been recorded. As soon as we hang up, then uh, I'll start the process of converting that to a format to get it online. And you'll be able to find that at the URL you see at the at the top of the slide that we have here. And so um, ellisonchair.tamu.edu slash multimedia, which you just go over to the multimedia button and click on it to select webinars. And it has a list of all the previous webinars as well as a link to the, uh, the webinar today once I finish that up. 
so be sure to check that out and encourage other folks in your firms to check that out. Now, one last reminder, when we sign off, you'll be sent a link to an evaluation. If you can uh, fill out that evaluation in the next 90 seconds, that would be fantastic too. Ben, thank you again for a great job. Folks, thank you all for attending today. And, you'll, and be on the lookout for uh, an invitation to the next webinar in our series. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone.